if you're like me, you might hear estate planning and go, ugh, gross. You might think to yourself, I'm not sure why I'd bother with that. Estate planning is only for the uber rich. Tallgrass begs to differ. Tallgrass founding attorneys Laurel and Riley think everyone should have an estate plan. They know estate planning seems untouchable to a lot of folks, like something you have to do inside a stuffy law firm of Stuffy McLawyer Pants Esquire. But I promise you, Tallgrass is nothing like that. For one, they work out of their home so their clients can feel at home. They obsess, because they're nerds, over making clients feel like they belong and are supposed to be there. Also, their kids might make an appearance. They will take time to answer all of your questions, even the uncomfortable ones. They will work relentlessly to make sure your plan is exactly what you need to feel secure and at peace. So if you've been putting off planning for what's going to happen after you've gone, it's time for you to give Tallgrass a call at 918-770-8940 and start your plan today. Or visit their website at tallgrassestateplanning.com and schedule a free initial consultation. For free! It's right there on the website. And of course, there's more, because this is a podcast ad. If you tell them you're a Pot for Good listener, they're going to take 25% off their service fees. Just tell them Pot for Good sent you. Stop thinking estate planning isn't for you and give Tallgrass a call today at 918-770-8940 or on their website, which I'm not going to read out to you again. It's in our show notes. Thank you, Tallgrass. Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa and the world, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by, by Rant9 Productions, which is me and my company. So if you like how we sound and are thinking about starting a podcast, reach out to me. I am very easy to find on all social media channels. Pod for Good can be found anywhere you get your podcasts, which as of today's recording was not Spotify because they had a weird security certificate problem. Not important. We're moving on. I am, as always, your chief philanthropod and class clown for justice, numero uno to the to the uno power, Jesse Ulrich. You stole mine. I was going to go numero yes. uno. Mm. And I am your vice admiral philanthropod and class clown for justice, top gun. Chris Miller. Today, our guest is Cameron Walker, CEO of Green Country Habitat for Humanity. We talked to Cameron about what makes the Green Country Habitat for Humanity unique. We also talk about how they pivoted during COVID and the magic that is their restores. I'm very excited to check out these restores. My new house needs things. Uh, Enjoy. We are very excited to have Cameron from Green Country Habitat for Humanity on the podcast today. Uh, Cameron, how you doing? Very good. Thank you guys for the invite. We're listen. We're we're excited to talk to you. I've done some volunteer work with Habitat for Humanity, um, you know, recently when I was younger, and so it's, it's a great organization. So we're we are happy to have you and to talk about the great work you do. So well, thank you. Uh, I think maybe, I mean, I feel like. Some organizations we have on, people don't know about, but I feel like people kind of know about Habitat for Humanity, but why don't you give us a little, um, like a brief summary of at least what uh, Habitat for Humanity does here? Yeah, so um, Habitat obviously uh, has a a wonderful standing uh, all around the world, um, primarily known as a volunteer-led organization that builds uh, affordable housing. Um, we are a bit of an anomaly, um, and the pandemic is largely due to that. Um, but uh, uh, the traditional model of Habitat is we go out, fundraise the money to build a house, and then we invite volunteers to partner with us. And over the course of many months, we build a home. And um, COVID uh, threw a, a real curveball at that. And just based on social distancing and all of those things, our national office um, would not allow us to have volunteers. And so we were really faced with a, a, a dawning kind of uh, quandary. Do we shut everything down and go a year, 18 months to, we really didn't know how long we were going to go and not build any houses when the need is just continually compounding. And so we actually pivoted and borrowed a page out of the uh, for-profit sector. And so um, while most habitats 
kind of came to a, you know, a little bit of a drip through uh, COVID or unfortunately had to shutter their doors, we quadrupled our production. And um, we began using professional contractors. We created a network of regional and community banks uh, that started providing below market rate interest uh, for our homeowners. And then uh, kind of the secret sauce is forgivable down payment assistance. And so all that being said, you know, today we have uh, over 50 homes, single family homes under construction. Uh, we've got a 23 unit townhouse development uh, that's being constructed. And we're now squarely in kind of the top 10 of all habitats in the country as far as housing production. So we're, we're very fortunate. It has created a little bit of a challenge. We love our volunteers. Uh, there are some really great uh, opportunities to get volunteers involved. We've had to be a little creative because we don't want to lose the uh, momentum that we have. Uh, so we're really using volunteers now in the pre-production of homes. So we have, we're very fortunate to have a very large warehouse here. We invite volunteer groups from companies, from churches to come in, and they actually will pre-build an entire uh, set of uh, walls for one home. Some companies have done multiple homes, and we wait until the slab is on the ground, we'll bundle those, and then we drop ship them to the site, and the professionals take over. And so it's helped uh, save some money. It cuts about a day off of the framing, which, you know, we then, that's an expense we don't have to pass along to the homeowner. But we're, we're kind of easing back into it. Volunteers and a lot of companies, companies specifically that have gone remote is just kind of a way of operating uh, now and into the future or they have departments that are working hybrid schedules. It's not like back in the day when everybody was in the office five days a week and people were really clamoring to get out and volunteer. So that was a day out of the office. You know, now we're kind of competing with that flexibility that employees have, um, whether that be more time with the kids, whatever. So it, it's actually kind of worked out well. We're excited about it, but it's definitely a departure from what Habitat for Humanity is known for. So you mentioned that you've got a network of banks that you work with and they give some below market interest. Do they do they also help people qualify who maybe wouldn't be able to qualify for a normal mortgage? And how does that process work? Yeah, so maybe I should back up and kind of unpack the entire program. Habitat is a, a much uh, more complex monster than even I understood when I, I took the position. We are now a HUD approved homeowner counseling agency. So really our work with families starts long before they ever get the keys to their home. And we uh, do an orientation class where we invite everyone in. We kind of just give them kind of a 30,000 foot view of, of what this program entails, uh, the types of homes we build, income qualifications, things of that nature. And so after that, we invite families to apply if they think they would be a good candidate. And uh, once uh, they apply, we uh, do some pre-qualification. Um, and based on that, they're invited to come join the program. And then that's when the heavy lifting starts. We really put a lot of the onus on families to get through this program as fast or as slow as they want to go. Uh, most of our homeowners are extremely motivated. Uh, they are likely the first person in their immediate family that has the potential to own a home. And so what we see is our applicants typically kind of, they work themselves out of the program if this isn't a good fit. We do uh, stay on families, kind of encourage them. We're always inviting them to the next educational course. But there's a, about a year long to year and a half long curriculum based program that uh, they have to go through. And it's all set to set them up for success when they become a homeowner. So many people, especially, um, well, heck, my wife and I could have benefited greatly from going through something like this before we bought our first home. But we cover everything. We, we start really rudimentary. We come in with the assumption that, you know, you're not even banked. And a lot of our families, unfortunately, due to historical prejudice, things of that nature, they don't function inside the banking system. And so we've got a lot of payday lending. We've got a lot of money orders and things like that. So our first real, you know, kind of goal is to get those families established with a bank. So that's where our network of partner banks kind of start. So we, you know, we start with budgeting. We essentially kind of go through and explain all those things. If you have the benefit of having been raised by really involved parents, you know, they sit you down with a checkbook and they're going to tell, help you kind of learn to balance a checkbook, budget and things like that. 
we, we often have to kind of start at, at zero. And so we build up from there. We go into the power of credit. Why is ownership so powerful for families? And why is it one of the single best sources to help build not only equity, but multi-generational wealth that can be passed on. And so we, we really, um, you know, it's kind of a basic econ class initially. And then that kind of eventually kind of gravitates into, okay, well, great, you're, we're, we're going to buy this home. Now what? And so we get into a lot of the long-term maintenance uh, a lot of hands-on training, everything from unclogging a commode to leveling out cabinet doors. We send out blast notifications to our homeowners in the spring and fall and winter. You know, some of it has to do with, hey, remember, it's getting warm outside. Your lawn's going to start growing. If your lawn gets above this many inches, the city can cite you. You can get a fine. Um, some of it has to do with, remember, temperatures are going to go below freezing tonight. You know, leave a sink, you know, dripping, cover your outside faucets. We really try to be kind of all encompassing. So by the time they sign their mortgage documents, they get the keys to their home. They're set up for success. I think too often we we kind of focus on that. Let's build the house. Let's get a family in a home. And we really want to put a, a significant amount of time and effort into the education process. And ultimately, this is going to be a multi-generational trickle down is our hope. And um, so we, we want to invest and pour into these families as much as we can each time so that they can be successful. They can take these homes and achieve other goals as a family. You know, how can we take that equity and help pay for a child's college, or if we run into an unexpected medical event, you know, how can, you know, you use a home equity line of credit and things of that nature. So it's a, it's all encompassing and it's a long process. And so I'm often asked about the success and failure rate of our homeowners and uh, nationally Habitat's default rate is about half of what the general market is. And so I, I, again, you know, I kind of harken back to, to my wife and I buying our first home. We're in our early twenties and you know, we were really walking into it, you know, just from a standpoint of ignorance. And uh, you kind of learned, took your lumps and hopefully had friends or family you could kind of lean on. But we really work with that, that assumption that you don't have access to those networks. So we want to, to do everything we can to kind of set you up for hopefully a real life change in the trajectory of your family. I could really see the value in that. I mean, I'm somebody who was college educated, didn't try to buy their first house till they were in their 30s and works for a financial institution. And I remember, I know the struggles I went through navigating, getting a mortgage, buying a house, what to do after you bought a house. So I, I can't imagine somebody who didn't start with, you know, some of the privileges that I had knowing my struggle, understanding how difficult it would be for somebody who didn't have, didn't have that leg up. And I can see the value I would have gotten from all of the classes and education that you talked about something that could be valuable for really anyone, not just people going through that program. Well, the, the really cool thing about all of this is the banks that we work with actually are required by federal law to lend money to low-income census tracts, low-income borrowers. The challenge is, is the brick-and-mortar locations are usually located in affluent areas because that is where most financial institutions make their money. And so what we kind of our proposition that we make to these banks is, look, we can be that bridge. We have the relationships with these clients in these areas where you are required to lend. And they're required uh, to lend because of something called the Community Reinvestment Act. And so these banks, once they reach a certain size, they're required by law to fulfill these CRA credits or face a pretty substantial uh, penalty and fine. And so we're always looking for those banks that have either gone through an exam and, uh, you know, were written up and had some challenges or they know that they have one coming up and they're sorely lacking. And so that's kind of our, our value proposition for them. But it works out great for our families because, again, we're getting them banked. We're establishing a relationship. Many of our homeowners, it's it's there's so many misconceptions about the people we work with, but a lot of our homeowners are budding entrepreneurs. These are people that they've got a, a, a good paying 
hourly job with benefits and things like that, but they have kind of dreams and aspirations to, you know, start their own small business or something like that. So our hope is, is that, you know, creating that relationship with that financial institution, at least when they have that idea and they put together that business plan that now they have uh, an established relationship that they kind of leverage that'll, you know, again, in the same way that we kind of did the education on the homeowner side, you know, maybe it'll help them with a small business. Maybe it will help them financing that education for their child or something like that. So I have, I mean, I have two memories of volunteering. The, the most recent one was, I guess this was right before the pandemic. I remember volunteering to help build a, a Mekanaka's house. And yeah. I was, I was not needed. There were so many volunteers there. <laughs> uh, I was just like, anybody need anything? No. Okay. I was going to stand here. And then, you know, obviously like his house had some special things built into it. And the, the house launch had a lot of things I would say other Habitat for Humanity houses don't get when they open. But another memory I have, and you can tell me if Habitat for Humanity ever did this, or maybe still does this, is that I got to help tear down a house. And yeah, so that, yeah. that was the funnest thing I've ever done because they handed me a sledgehammer <laughs> and they're like, take down this wall. And I was like, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's funny um, early on. So I've been here. It'll be seven years in July or August. And I think within my first year, I, I was meeting with a pretty predominant, very large church here in town. And they said, well, look, you know, we really don't have any interest in building. You know, it seems like that's a pretty big commitment. But, you know, if if you ever had an instance where for one day we could come in and just demo or tear something down and <laughs> we do that, it's probably not as regular of an occurrence uh, as uh, we would like it to have. There's a number of other kind of mitigating, mitigating like safety issues <laughs> with that. But of the times we've done that, it's been a lot of success. And I think there's probably that bent up aggression thing that, you know, <laughs> folks uh, it's hey, nice. just tear it up, you know? Yeah. So. I mean, people pay for that now. You That's know, true. They yeah, 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 get this there, room, so yeah. it sounds yeah. like a great fundraiser. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, and you could yes. knock down a wall. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like it. Yeah. Well, and, I like it. and the reason I asked that that question of Habitat for Humanity still does that, because at least here in uh in Tulsa, like what it appears to me, like homes weren't there yet. And so these are like new properties. And maybe I'm wrong. But I, I know from your website that you guys are focusing both on in Kendall Whittier and in Springdale. And so how many homes are you tearing down to build new ones? Or are they mostly new neighborhoods that you're building? The vast majority of what we have built up until the last year has been what's considered infill. So there used to be a home there or there is a home that, you know, is beyond the point of salvaging. We demo it and build a new home in its place. But as, as we have really been trying to answer the demand, the city of Tulsa, the county, and then very large philanthropic foundations here in town have have kind of poured in some investment into to our organization, but you know they want to see results and they want to know that that families are getting impacted. So I think the number it's roughly around Tulsa today. The current demand for affordable housing we're about five thousand units short in Tulsa County, and there are other communities where that number is exponentially higher, but. You know, when I'm looking at it and, and you know, when I started, we were building about 10 to 15 homes a year. And so just with the compounding demand, we weren't really even making a dent. And so it was helping those few families that we were. But, you know, we really want to be an agent of change. And so in a lot of these neighborhoods, Kendall Whittier specifically, we work in a community. If you guys are familiar with the Outsiders House Museum, it's located in Crutchfield. That's a community we build in. And then we're really in 2021, we announced our North Tulsa initiative. And so we've committed to build building 250 new homes uh, in North Tulsa over the next five years. And what we're attempting to do, and, and we've got a few developments going right now, where we're taking a raw piece of undeveloped land and we're essentially building a neighborhood. And so there's a lot of efficiencies in there on the construction side when we can bid out a project that has 20 homes. Typically, we can see some uh, savings with our contractors on that because literally all they have to do is jump from you know lot to lot to lot. Previously, we might have one lot on this block and then drive three streets over, there's another lot and then drive 10 blocks over. So um, all of that adds additional expense. So we're, we're really trying to be creative and, and nimble uh, based on the need. North Tulsa in particular, I gave a couple of tours today, in fact, driving around up there showing some of our projects. And in North Tulsa, it's, it, it, it has stereotypically 
I think people, you know, whether it be based on media or, or what, they think of it as like the South side of Chicago. And it's not a super dense urban setting. It actually looks more rural than anything. And on this last tour I was uh, this afternoon, I said, you know, there's a lot of farmland up here. And I said, you'll generally see occasionally people up here riding on horses or you see cattle. And man, we came over the top of the hill and there's a guy on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> so um, so it, it really it, there's a lot of opportunity because there is available land. And I, I'm I'm very biased. Obviously, I'm, I'm on the housing side of this, but. Housing is really a catalyst for further economic development. At an organization I worked at previously, we were really working and trying to attract a grocer to come to North Tulsa. And this was before Fresh Market was even kind of conceived. And what we kept hearing, it wasn't that, you know, we think, you know, there's not enough income in this area or we think that, you know, there's too much crime. What they did was they would look at GIS and they would look at an aerial and they would count rooftops and they were like, it's not dense enough to support a store. And so in in whatever way we can impact that and cre- increase the density, we know that businesses, when they're analyzing areas for opportunity, are going to be looking at rooftops. Further, if you want to push that on, the way we fund our public school system here is through county property tax. So when we have these neighborhood schools in North Tulsa that are not being funded at the same level as a public school in South Tulsa, this is another way to increase that that revenue stream that's coming into those those schools. So I, I'm sure if uh, somebody worked in economic development or something, they would think that, you know, they would say they're kind of the, the tip of the spear. But I really do believe housing drives a, a lot of these other things that are needed to really have healthy, vibrant communities. So when you're, I guess, reviewing and vetting who comes into the program, I'm trying to think how best to word this, how do you make sure that it goes not only to to people who need houses, but making sure that it goes to local people from the area rather than maybe people coming from outside trying to move into an area? Or even is that part of part of your process? Yeah. So as a HUD homeowner counseling agency, we don't discriminate in any way, but those are very real concerns. We do a lot of work with our civic leaders and counselors and community stakeholders, and you echo a lot of their sentiment. You know, we we don't want this area to be gentrified. We want it to help the people that have lived here for generations. And so there's two th- two factors. One, the Habitat program is almost exclusively an income-based program. So each year HUD releases a chart and essentially it says, this is the maximum amount of money this household can make for one person. I think it goes all the way up to 11 or 12 people in the household. And so HUD sets that and that's what we base everything on. In the Tulsa County, in this is a little off, but it's it's close. The median income of a family of four is somewhere between fifty four and fifty seven thousand dollars, and so we work with families that make roughly between thirty to eighty percent of that, and that's kind of the cap is eighty percent of the area median income. So these are families, you know, I can you know rattle off a, a number of of big companies, these big employers, and these are these are solid good, largely hourly paying jobs, or we've got a lot of folks that are kind of in medical assisting LPNs and and, and things from that. But we have a lot of folks that are working in big uh, manufacturing facilities. The, the challenge is, is if you add a child or two, there's not a lot of disposable income. And so rents uh, in Tulsa County over the last two years, in 2021, they increased by about 19%. And in 2020, they went up 12%. So by and large, most of the families we serve, when they get a mortgage, they get a pay bump because their mortgage payment is oftentimes less than what their rent was. And now we're building equity. We've got a little bit more money in our pocket for kiddos, for gas. You know, I mean, we're, we're really in unprecedented waters, at least in my time in this industry, where the challenges are significant and just seem to be compounding. But 
income-based restrictions are, are the big piece that kind of ensure that families that are, are truly in need are able to, to take part in the program. The second part is, you know, largely we don't see kind of that, I guess gentrification would be a good word. It's not so much economic. A lot of times it comes down to areas of town we're working in. I can tell you we've got a, a development in East Tulsa uh, that'll have 19 homes. It's called Buena Vida. Well, we named it that because East Tulsa is really becoming a vibrant part of the Latino community. And so we know that the majority of families that are going to be applying over there largely are going to be Latino. Conversely, same as we're working in North Tulsa, we know that applicants that want to live in North Tulsa, you know, were typically born and raised there. We've got family there. Their house of worship is there. And so that's where they want to be. So we don't do a whole lot of social engineering. We are very upfront with our families about where we're building. And what we typically see is, is you know, if you're from a certain community, that's typically where you want to to try and try and live. So the, the challenge is, is, trying to build up that capacity so that we can have multiple focuses all throughout the the Tulsa metro area that are really trying to serve as many different populations as we can. We used to ask this question when we interview people in person before the pandemic, and then the pandemic, so I think, geared us away from asking this question because we were just dealing with the things that are happening right now. But I feel like for your organization, this is going to be a fun question for you to answer, (laughs) which is just say a donor gave you a billion dollars tomorrow. like. What would you do? Oh, man. Well, you know, like most nonprofits, we are running very lean. Um, Most of the folks on our staff are wearing many hats. And so I think that's just kind of the nature of nonprofits. But with something like that, I think whether it be a North Tulsa or another area of town there, you know, we're focused right now on North Tulsa. That's kind of a big push for us. But there are other areas all throughout the community um, I think land control is the big one. Again, what we really do well is when there is a community that has been under-resourced for decades and there's no real active real estate market, it's definitely not increasing, it's stagnant, or it's going down. We can kind of come in and be that tip of the spear in kind of stabilizing a real estate market. The big thing for us is we don't want to be the only builder in an area. We really, really b- believe and strive for mixed income development. We obviously don't build three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar homes, but there are private builders that do. And so, we want to see this really healthy development where you've got neighbors of varied socioeconomic status, different education, you know, all of that. And a multitude of studies uh, done throughout many decades about the value, the folks that are on the lower rungs of the ladder, when they are living and working and doing life in and amongst people uh, that are higher up on the ladder, almost always you see those people that are on the lower rung begin to, to have the ability to climb up. You're establishing these relationships and networks that you didn't have access to before. Some of it is is just simply modeling and being exposed to, to different cultures, different ways of life. And so I that's a that's a hard one. I would probably try to fill in some gaps on our staffing, but you know, with with that kind of resources, you know, we certainly could go in I'll probably get dinged for this, but in a lot of these communities, these homes that were built post-World War II, a lot of times with the GI Bill, they've just fallen into disrepair over years, and private landlords have bought these and created these portfolios. And it's really, it's not across the board. There are some very good landlords out there, but there are some that bank these large portfolios of rentals. And they do not make the investment year after year to keep those properties in working condition. They're oftentimes not safe. They're not fully functional. So quite honestly, I think, you know, as long as long as I was talking, I would probably attempt to buy out a lot of these portfolio landlords 
and either actively rehab these properties, the ones that you can save and kind of improve, you know, just the structure and the, the curb appeal of these properties or wreck them and go back with, with new construction. Because that really is an impediment in a lot of the neighborhoods we work in where we can go into a, a lot where there's not a house and usually buy the lot and build a new home. But, you know, then you look across the street or you look side to side and these are rental properties and the, the landlord is not really motivated uh, to do anything except code inspection, keep code inspection off their back. And so it's a really vicious cycle. And if we could pick off a couple of those large portfolio owners, I think that would that would help make some significant significant change in some of these areas. Before we um, started, we, we were chatting a little bit about the move from Tulsa Habitat for Humanity to Green Country Habitat for Humanity. What What do you see long term for growth of your organization into areas outside of Tulsa? Currently, we're servicing five counties uh, in the metro area. Originally, we were Tulsa Habitat for Humanity. We only serviced the Tulsa MSA, so essentially Tulsa County. In 2021, we merged with Claremore Habitat for Humanity, and we took on Rogers County. And since then, uh, we have assumed Osage, Creek, and Wagner County. Now, uh, one of the things I haven't mentioned yet, we're pretty unique as a nonprofit in that we open, we run uh, retail stores called the Restore that are open to the public. And so these are, if you can think of kind of like maybe Goodwill, but for furniture, building materials, appliances, things of that nature, that's what these are. And so we have gone from one store to five stores in the last six years. And the the net benefit of that is that the revenue off of those stores, that's how we pay our employees. That's how we pay our benefits. That's how we keep the lights on, pay insurance. And so it, it helps significantly when we are approaching funders because all funders want to know how much of every dollar is ultimately getting to the people that need it. And so we're just in a pretty unique position to go, well, all of it's going to be put into that program. And so that was a big driver. We have uh, restores now down in Jinx. We have them in Broken Arrow. The way Habitat's rules are, uh, technically, you're not supposed to cross county lines to pick up a donation. And so we we got into a couple of those situations where, you know, we ran to the far south of Tulsa County and there was this home builder. They were going to be knocking this you know, great home down and be putting up a bigger home. And our deconstruction program could have gone in and taken out anything salvageable, polished it up, resold it. And so um, we pushed out one for that. But what, one of the things that we didn't really anticipate was as we did this, we started kind of looking at the situation, the housing challenges in some of these rural communities. And there's such a focus on your urban settings and the bigger metro areas and there's kind of that focus on, on those areas thinking, you know, this is where all the need is. Well, rural Oklahoma has some real challenges as far as housing. We've had some great conversations up in Pawhuska. We've been over in Claremore or around there, even as far as Bristow down in Creek County. There's some opportunities to really do some effective work in some of these communities. And in my opinion, Tulsa, just because of its size, you've got you know, a plethora of private builders. Well, you go to some of these communities, there might be one home builder and they're doing three or four custom homes a year and that's about it. And so what is everybody else supposed to do? And so um, Pawhuska was a, a unique one because a lot of the homes that used to be available as rentals or as owner-occupied homes have been sold and converted into Airbnbs. And uh, um, because of the success, the Mercantile and the Drummond family has had up there, which is great. But what they found was a lot of they're, – they're having a real challenge recruiting and retaining employees because of the commute a lot of their employees are having to make. So it's just unique challenges. But you know, ultimately, we, we want to be a resource that can serve – at least those five counties, if not all, of Northeast Oklahoma. There's some great partnerships potentially to be had with some of the, the Native American tribes that are all beginning to do some kind of housing work or have been doing housing work. But there's there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity. And I kind of look at it, I love to say yes until I absolutely have to say no. So the more geography we have, you know, there are certain resources and monies that are available 
in rural communities, USDA funds and things like that, you can't get when you're in Tulsa County and, and vice versa. So has Gr- Green Country Habitat for Humanity been researching or looking into those 3D printed homes? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's funny you say that. And I'll, I'll share a little bit. I can't can't name any names, but yeah, we, we had a, a meeting with a, a company that has really become kind of a leader in that emerging market. In fact, there are a couple of habitats around the country, the Southwest in particular, that have done a, a few of those homes. I can say, like all technologies, there's going to be kind of that early adopter phase and they're going to be the guinea pigs. Because we're so cost conscious, because every dollar we can save is one less dollar we have to pass along to the borrower. Right now, the value add is not there completely. But with all things, I mean, I remember when I was a kid and CD players came out and they were like a thousand bucks. And so in a very short order, they became very affordable and everybody had one. So, um, you know, I kind of hope and I'm anticipating uh, that there'll be improvements in technology that will help both the speed and the affordability of it. It, It's really great, highly energy efficient. The technology around it is, you know, super cool. And uh, there's all sorts of things you can achieve with moldable concrete that you can't achieve with straight lumber. And um, so it, it'll be neat to see how it 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 comes along. We we have uh, built some uh, uh, composite foam uh, preformed. What am I trying to say? Some panel homes. So these are homes that it, it's akin to a Yeti cooler. Virtually the same technology. So instead of a, a Yeti is kind of these two pieces of metal and there's an air gap and that's what's kind of creating that insulation. These, it's two thin layers of uh, fiberglass composite material, and then the inside of it is foam. And so, Jesse, you and I could stand with a 30-foot span of this. It's going to go on the roof, and both both of us could easily pick it up. And so it's super lightweight. They design it on the computer. They cut it out, and then they deliver it, and it's putting together a big Lego set. And the, the real net benefit of the homes that we built uh, in partnership with uh, a company that's building those, they go up, it increases the speed uh, of the construction, and these are insect resistant, they're fire retardant, um, but they are highly, highly energy efficient. We work on something called the HERS rating scale for um, energy efficiency. And when we had our first home kind of HERS rated, it's so far off the charts efficient that I don't think we had a category. And so the, one of the interesting things, you know, the half ton HVAC unit that we use typically on our houses or one ton unit was far too big for these panel homes because they didn't need as much heating and cooling. And so every one of these homes that we built, we, we incorporated something that's pretty prevalent in Europe. Well, I guess I should just say around the world. But you'll see it in some major metro areas and, and high-rise buildings, but the mini split systems. And so it's it's a HVAC system that you can essentially kind of go room to room. And like if you're not using this bedroom, if you know a child's off at college, you can kind of cordon it off and you're not having to pay to heat and cool that. But once you kind of stabilize your temperature in the house and you don't open a door, you don't open the windows it will hold a consistent temperature for many more hours than a traditionally built house. And so ultimately it reduces the amount that that our families were having to pay for utilities. Again, they're still kind of struggling through some of that, that, you know, early technology kind of lumps. I think they're going to get it. There's some companies, I know we worked with a local company that was doing that, but everybody, whether you're building a million dollar custom home or you're building one of our homes, everybody's attempting right now to try and find ways to shave expense and uh, kind of contain costs. You mentioned saving. Everybody's trying to, you know, save on builds and stuff like that. You also briefly talked about your restore. So what kind of, what kind of stuff do you offer there? So if somebody is say needing to do projects around the house or say is in the process of buying a new house and may have to do some repairs like Jesse, what kind of things would they be able to find it at one of the habitat restore? locations? So the Restore, I always just kind of refer to it as the discount version of Lowe's and Home Depot. We're, we're certainly not as big. Our, our bigger, our biggest store is around 35,000, 40,000 square feet, but it's a mixture. There's two things we primarily sell. One is donated product. So 
let's just use Jesse as an example. If he's going to be remodeling a kitchen, he can either have his contractor remove the old appliances, remove the countertops, cabinets, things like that, drive it over, donate it, or our deconstruction team will come out at no charge and we will take everything off site. And it's savings for the person doing the remodeling because they're not having to pay for a container to haul it away. It's keeping things out of the landfill. It's really that old adage, you know, it's one man's trash is another man's treasure. And I'm continually stunned what some people consider trash. We have high-end luxury appliances that are donated. But again, it's, it's primarily furniture, building materials, appliances, but we've expanded uh, even into rugs. We're one of the only habitats in the country that we know of that has a full service custom cabinet shop. And so we build, it was originally started to build cabinets for the habitat homes where volunteers would come in, but it's over time it has expanded where we are working with home remodelers, new construction. And uh, so we have a staff of four or five guys out there that are working. We supplement with some kind of longtime volunteers uh, that work in the, the cabinet shop. So it's actually become a little bit of a revenue stream for us as well that we then can kind of reinvest into the, the housing mission. But the if you had to look at our restores, probably about 40 to 50 percent of it is donated material. And then let's just call it 50 and 50. And then the other 50 percent is what's called buy for resale. So it's liquidated items. So it could be everything from it's brand new tile, but it's last year's edition. And so the supplier or the retailer is clearing the shelves to make room. And so they're liquidating it. So we buy a lot of 18 wheelers sight unseen. We know it's tile. We don't necessarily know what color, but we take advantage of that. Rugs, again, the huge category for us, paint and paint supplies. I I don't want to pick on any of the big paint paint supply companies, but if you're doing any painting, you need to check out one of the restores. Uh, there's a significant savings to be had on both those paint supplies and paint. I can imagine on rugs too. Rugs are stupid expensive. Yeah. They are stupid yeah. expensive. It's uh, uh, a significant savings. <laughs> and we have been very fortunate to find a couple of really great vendors where I probably couldn't say this when I started, but the, the rugs we're selling now are very appealing and they're the things people would be very proud to have in their home. They don't have large game animals on them anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, for our listeners, when I started scheduling this episode with Cameron, I was not in the house buying market, nor was I thinking of buying a house. And between then and now I have now technically bought a house and um, <laughs> things happen quickly. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna be checking out those stores. Is, is that store the, at least now the best way to support Habitat for Humanity? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's the fuel in our motor. Each time that we can put a new store on the ground, what we have, have ultimately been able to do is add another one, two, three skilled employees to our staff. So when we opened our Jinx store um, last year, we were able to hire an architect to come in house. And so instead of us having to go to an architecture firm every time we needed to do a slight redesign on a plan, now we have somebody in here full time that that's their job and they're working exclusively for us. So hiring a dedicated land and development coordinator. So somebody that all they are doing is looking for available property. Um, once we get it, they're trying to lay it out and, and yield the most amount of housing that we can on a piece of property. So those stores, again, are our lifeblood. Um, and so we're going to continue pushing into that. The people that shop at these stores, I mean, and I'm not lying when I say this, we have customers that come in every day to just take a quick glance because it, it's an interesting store and I had no appreciation for it uh, before I began working here. But if, if you look at the sales floor at nine in the morning and you look at the sales floor right before we close at six, it's turned over. And um, because stuff is going out the door, new donations are coming in. So our Facebook page, and, and don't quote me on this because it's been a while since I looked at it, but at one point we had about 35,000 followers on our Facebook page. And um, for many years, we exclusively uh, marketed through Facebook. And so each time we, we have you know, our trained associates over there, something comes in, they're taking a photo, they're pricing it. 
And so uh, people are just calling us constantly going, I saw this on Facebook. Can I pay for it right now? Hold it, you know, things like that. So it's, it's an interesting ecosystem. I haven't seen it at a lot of other stores, but it's just because of the variety and the, the uniqueness of a lot of stuff. And, and again, with all of the movement, especially in the last couple of years, it's been happening while interest rates were low and, you know, people were at home, they were doing a lot of home improvement projects. And so we saw a lot of uh, people that were buying very nice homes, but they wanted to overhaul. So, you know, getting a, you know, sub-zero refrigerator, full set of like Thermador appliances, things like that donated. It's just crazy. And then, you know, even we have uh, other uh, retailers that, you know, dent and ding items, or they had something that was ordered slightly wrong, you know, so it's, it wasn't the exact right size window or door. And so after time, you know, they've been storing it in their warehouse and it gets to kind of this critical mass. And then they go, Hey, call, call Habitat, see if they'll send a truck. Can we dump something off? And so that happens a lot too. So it's, it's a bit of a treasure hunt. And the, you know, funny story, I tell people about this. When I got hired, I had never heard of the restore. <laughs> And somehow during the course of our conversation with the board of directors, it didn't even come up. So when I started, I showed up here and they gave me a tour and they're like, well, this is our restore. I'm like, what is this? Well, <laughs> I, was, I was talking with my mother a few days later and she's like, oh, yeah, I've been shopping there for the last 10 years. She's like, I love that place. So <laughs> so it's it they're, they're really a hidden gem. And, um, you know, now that we have five locations come into one, you don't find exactly what you need. I'm like, well, you got four more. And it's, it's, again, it's a little bit of a treasure hunt, but you know, for the, the, the amount of savings that you can realize for some, some quality material, it's a great find. Well, there, there's someone who lives Jesse, in my house with me. it looks like there's one just a couple miles from you. Yeah. I'm still going to check them out. There's definitely someone <laughs> who lives in this house who likes treasure hunts for this sorts of things. Oh, I know uh, for sure. And by the way, I'd like, so one of the Facebook pages didn't come up, but the the one on Memorial has 9,000 Facebook followers and the Broken Arrow one has like 3,000. And whoever runs that store is very good at Facebook because there's lots of videos of him talking about things that are in that store. So well done to <laughs> yeah, that gentleman. And, and, and what we really had to kind of fight with, okay, every time we have a new store, does it need a dedicated Facebook page? And so those stores are continuing to build our Tulsa Facebook page for that restore is, is just a monster. And I, I'm not a guru on Facebook marketing, but man, when we would boost those posts, you know, we would see crazy numbers, 105,000 people viewed this, you know, things like that. So um, it, it, it's been really been good to us. And again, it, it's a great service for the community, but, you know, just like Chris was saying, I mean, it's, a, or, or maybe you just, it's a fantastic way to support our mission of housing without having to come out and swing a hammer. I mean, you're just going to be a, a donor, a donor or a consumer. It's all helping the mission of affordable housing in the Tulsa area. By the way, the page for Green Country Restore Tulsa has almost fifty thousand likes. All right, that's unreal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, little old uh, Green Country Habitat. Mm -hmm. What are other ways people can yes, um, support? Uh, green Country Habitat for Humanity beyond shopping at Restore? Well, I mean, it, it's usually pretty self-evident with us uh, nonprofit folks. I mean, we, we are looking uh, for folks that, that want to partner financially with us. Um, the, the volunteer component is huge. It helps uh, significantly. Again, you know, as we're shifting into that pre-construction piece, that, that's a, a huge way that companies, churches, we even have these civic groups, Rotary and different things that have come out and done things like that. So that's a great way uh, to support us. The restores, again, fantastic. But, you know, we're looking for those folks, you know, it's $5, $10 a month. That adds up when it's compounded. And again, I would love to sit here and tell you that we had, you know, enough staff that could, you know, kind of be dedicated in one area. But again, most all of our employees are wearing multiple hats and do a fantastic job. But we certainly, uh, the more of those uh, skill sets that we can bring in house, that actually results in a net savings because that's one less vendor that we have to kind of reach out to. So it's in our, you know, kind of our mission of affordable housing. And so that has been really challenging as material prices have gone up, you know, two, 300, 400 percent in the last 24 months supply chain breakdowns. I mean, 
we had a development uh, called Peace Point, and they were supposed to be full bricked homes. Well, when we went to order brick, the brick, you know, uh, vendor was like, we can give you about a six of what you need. So we had to kind of change on the fly and use some hardy board siding on three quarters of it. And then the front was brick. So we, we've had to become very nimble, but we do have that. That's a, another great thing. We have a, a handful of companies that have been generous donors over the year in by way of supplies and material. And so whether that be windows, whether that be roofing material, those are always good ways. So if you own a company, you're in a construction trade, you know, even if you wanted to come out and uh, donate your professional services on a house to us, the net savings is really meaningful, you know, when it it, is being, that savings is being passed on to those homeowners. So if, if, if uh, folks have a a creative uh, idea in mind, um, again, uh, we want to say yes until we absolutely have to say no. So we'll we'll entertain it. And um, again, we just want to do all that we can to really maximize the amount of work that we can do to serve as many uh, Tulsa area families in need of affordable housing. Because so many people are just today just priced out of buying a home. Um, you cannot walk into a bank with at a certain level income and man, if you have a little bit of student debt, you've got a car note, you know, you just, you have risk shining above your head. And so banks aren't going to be real apt to uh, sign up for, for a 30 year mortgage. So it's uh, many ways to partner. And so we, we take all comers. For all our listeners, like, please go shop at the restore, donate money to have it have for humanity, volunteer when you're allowed to volunteer again. And, um, you know, just remember if you need a house torn down, like, Call call me and Chris first. We'll take care of it. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Cameron, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll sign whatever waivers you yeah, need us to. Yes, yeah. yeah like, we'll, we'll give you the hard hat. So. All right. <laughs> it's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to our episode with Cameron. If you want to support Green Country Habitat for Humanity, please go check out one of their restores. That is how they pay their bills because people don't want to pay overhead, which by overhead we mean people's salaries. So go to their stores, donate money online, volunteer to build slash destroy a home. Chris and I are down for that soon. The link to their website on our show notes, as well as a link to the, one of their restores Facebook pages, which is a delight. You'll enjoy. Please make sure to follow Pot for Good on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all the things. Uh, subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And most importantly, if you like the episode, one, leave us a review, which we'll read on air if there are any new ones. But that is the best way for us to grow. So if you find the shtick Chris and I do in entertaining in any way, please let other people know so that they listen. Um, as always, get it done, Tulsa. Broken Arrow, you, you haven't done anything recently to embarrass me, so you get off this week. Uh, be safe out there, everybody. Bye.